sorry to bother you. Can I get an AV person up here? Oh, you mean a uh
All right, everybody, if you could find your seats, we're going to go ahead and get started on our next block of talks, workflow from chip to product. Before we get started, too, we have this giant, awesome photo booth in the back, so make sure you check that out at the next break. We're going to have a nice hour and a half for lunch for you guys, so you've got plenty of time to photo booth and eat. Okay, our next speaker is Eric Wilhelm from Autodesk, so please give him a round of applause. Thanks. So uh, I'm an entrepreneur and engineer. I've started a bunch of companies, but most notably probably Instructables. And I now work at Autodesk, where I run, continue to run the Instructables business. Uh, I also build labs, so I built our Pier 9 creative workshop in San Francisco. And then the thing I want to talk about today is the other thing I do, which is uh, building our Autodesk's hardware business. So my group designs and manufactures our Ember 3D printer. I was here maybe, I was here four years ago where I spoke about uh, how 13 year olds and rubber bands powered an open source uh, connects gun community on Instructables. 
just for, for uh, update, that Connects gun community is still going extremely strong. And then uh, finally, and probably most importantly, the uh, little girl who was distraught about not getting to pull the trigger on uh, shooting her first duck that, uh, that Anne-Marie showed is actually my daughter. This is Ember. Ember is a stereophography DLP printer. And what that means is we have a projector, and the projector projects an image into a UV-sensitive glue, and layer by layer builds up uh, a part. Let's see a video of that. This is a time lapse, so this print takes a couple of hours, but what's happening is each layer is being photosensitively cured by that projector and then lifted out of the vat of goo. This is Ember in uh, a jeweler studio. So Ember's really designed for jewelers, dental labs, and researchers, and this is how it actually looks for real in a, in a jeweler studio. And jewelers really like Ember because of the high resolution. These are some uh, peacock feather pendants that uh, a jeweler's making. And this is a, a microscope image of them. The scale bar, which you probably just can barely see, is a one millimeter. So, the resolution on the machine is uh, 50 microns, X and Y, and then down to 10 microns in Z. So the voxel size is 50, 50 by 10 microns. And the materials that we've worked on are intended for post-printing processes. So what that means is you print something in this photoactive polymer, but then you take it through investment casting. So you'd cover it in a ceramic slurry, burn out the polymer, and then backfill with metal. So in this picture, the blue is the uh, investment casting resin we developed, and then the the silver is actually the silver uh, peacock feather. This is some other jewelry that we've done. This is a dental guard. So dent dentists will use this to help uh, operations in the teeth. So they'll, they'll print a, a guard like this to then help guide them in some of their operations. And these are some bridges. So one of our dental lab customers uh, integrated Ember and in less than two months uh, printed a thousand of these uh, bridges and crowns. So they integrated it into their business and started selling stuff very quickly, which is awesome. I love it when our customers can, can make stuff. And one of the reasons they really like Ember is because it's built for a production environment. So this is the software that drives a thing, and uh, it's intended for multiple machines and multiple users. So multiple, multiple operators can come in and set up prints and get things going, and they can look at their whole effectively factory of uh, printers making, in this case, bridges. So you, you, might be, you might think, doesn't Autodesk make software? What is this with a 3D printer? And yeah, that's true. And that actually presented a little bit of a problem. So uh, I actually started this hardware group secretly. And this is a picture of a supply a storage closet. So this is, this is where we were for the first six months. And inside the storage closet, I packed in a bunch of hardware engineers, and we secretly built this product under the nose of tax, legal, finance, and anyone who could really get in our way before we announced. And we took, the, we took, the, we took this from idea of we're going to do hardware into actually shipping to customers in 11 months. So it was an extremely rapid process. But there, there is a connection to the broader software, which is we're working on software to make 3D printing better. So we're working on this uh, platform called Spark, which is software for 3D printing. And the idea is that the software for 3D printing is sucked for something like two decades. So we're, we're, we're trying to make it a bit better. And Ember is the reference hardware for how we think people should use our software. So the idea here is we can show the connected workflow from design all the way to printed part using all of the Spark platform with Ember. Now, because we're new to this hardware game, we can think a bit differently about it. So this is actually the formulation for our resin. Most 3D printer companies uh, effectively sell razor blades. They sell you the, the resins or the materials, and they do so at extreme markups. Uh, but because that's not what we're after, uh, we can open source our resin. So this is, the form, this is literally the formulation of the resin that we sell. We encourage people to make it, remix it, change it up, uh, and make it themselves if they want to. We've also open sourced the hardware. So this is the hardware for Ember, and this is fully available on uh, Fusion. So you can go and you can check out what's going on. You can then 
presumably you can potentially make it yourself. I will say that a bunch of the parts are injection molded, so it's not exactly practical, but this is more of a, it's about opening and showing what we're doing and how we did it. So having an open platform actually uh, leads to some interesting problems. So this is the resin tray. This is a top-down image of the tray where you pour the resin. And so Ember is literally open in that you can pour whatever you want into the resin tray. We have no, we don't prevent you from using someone else's resin. You can put whatever you want in there. And that leads to a few problems, which is some of the third-party resins that work with our uh, UV, with our projector, uh, actually attack the resin tray. And so this resin tray cracked due to uh, a component of one of the third-party resins. And we, not only do we encourage you to do this, in our software we have third-party resins built in for the default. So it's not like this is just a, hey, you can do this if you want. This is literally built directly into the software. You can use other people's resins. But that leads to problems like this. So this is, we've got to change up the materials and make a new tool to make this thing. So you get some problems when you open your platform. So what we're doing uh, here and officially on Monday is we're opening Ember's firmware and the electronics. Uh, so it's more, more fun. This is the electronics. So this is, uh, the electronics are a clone of a BeagleBone Black, and we've made a few improvements. There's a USB hub, there's in, uh, additional memory, and there's a few uh, power management. And we're uh, releasing this under a Creative Commons license. This is a flow chart of the firmware. We're releasing the firmware, too. The firmware runs uh, both on the Citara, on the, the BeagleBone, but then also on a couple AVRs for the motor controllers. Now, the board itself, it's a six-layer board, so you're probably not going to fab this thing yourself. It's a pretty complicated uh, uh, board. But again, this is, this is a commitment to an open platform. It's a commitment that we're doing this differently. We want people to come in and look at what's going on. We want them to understand. We want effectively to make this whole 3D printing and additive manufacturing thing a lot better by thinking about it in an open way. If you really, really want the stuff before it goes live on the Ember site on uh, Monday, here's, an, here's a horrible URL that you can take a picture of to get it. But if you, but if you want to see it on Monday, it'll be at uh, ember.autodesk.com. Now, doing open source in a uh, billion dollar publicly traded company has some interesting uh, connotations. So this is a fun email that I received from our uh, legal director. Uh, and we... Uh, compromised on, so in this particular case, I told her that I would uh, contact her before I open, I quote, open sourced anything further, and we agreed that I would uh, advise all of you that Ember is a class A uh, device, meaning that it is meant only for uh, businesses and not meant for residential, because we did not get the, we didn't put a big enough Faraday cage around the thing, so it spits out a bunch of EMI noise. That said, here we are, so <laughs> when, you, when you open source stuff, you, uh, you, uh, have to run it by legal. That's it. I hope you guys will all check it out. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, so I'm Sam Wurzel. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Octopart, and Octopart is a search engine for electronic parts. Uh, I'm here with Sanke Gupta, who's also with Octopart, and we're going to talk today about the Common Parts Library. So the Common Parts Library is a list of commonly used electronic components for connected device applications. And um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Common Parts Library, uh, how it came about, um, what the inspiration was. Um, we're going to talk about the Common Parts Library for production, and uh, then Sankit's going to speak about the new Common Parts Library for prototyping. So back in the spring of 2014, um, I was at MakerCon, and I had a conversation with Eric Pan at Seed Studio. And at that time, he was working on something called the Open Parts Library, which is a list of electronic components that was available in his supply chain. And the purpose behind it was to speed up the assembly and manufacturing 
of electronic, uh, electronic products that were being manufactured by seed. And I thought that this was a really interesting idea because around the same time, I was traveling around to our customers, to contract manufacturers, to hardware startups that were building new hardware devices and trying to get a sense of what their pain points were. And what I heard a lot was that when a product was going into production, oftentimes they would build a PCB, they would send it off to the contract manufacturer, maybe a thousand pieces, they would order the bomb, and there would be one or two parts that they realized they couldn't get in volume because when they were building the bill of materials and designing the product, they weren't thinking about supply chain issues. Um, they were just thinking about, okay, what part can I use in the prototype? Sure, we'll be able to get it in production. It, it doesn't really work like that. You have to be thinking about production when you're in the prototyping phase. So, um, so in this conversation I was having with Eric, we, we thought there could be, there's an opportunity to create a more broad list of commonly used electronic components that could be applicable to a broader set of devices. And that was the, the beginning of the common parts library. Um, and, and so that, that kicked off an effort at Octopart to develop this list and, and really with, with the two stated goals that I was alluding to before. One is that we, we want to make the component selection easier. So rather than sifting through the 30 million parts that we have in our database, you, we, can, we can suggest, hey, check out these sensors, check out these connectors, check out these interface ICs. They're widely available in the supply chain and they're what everybody's already using right now. Um, and then the other piece of it is when you go into manufacturing, we, you can feel confident that those parts are going to be available in the supply chain at the volumes uh, you're going to need. So um, we also started working with a bunch of um, hardware, open hardware companies, the logos are below, um, to, to help us get that input about what are the right parts to include. And, and this is really an, an open collaboration between us, the community, the companies below, and um, and really the, the entire open hardware community. So that's the history. Um, and we had this idea in around April of last year. In September, we launched the Common Parts Library for Production. At the time, we didn't call it the Common Parts Library for Production. We just called it the Common Parts Library. And it was mostly surface mount components, um, components that would be useful for going into production. And we got some really great feedback right away which was that this was, uh, this was good for production, but um, when, you know, when, when you were just designing something, the, uh, these weren't necessarily the best parts to use. And, and Slackit's gonna speak to that in a bit, but before that, I just wanna point out a couple of the features of the, the CPL for production. Um, so this is one small, uh, one small set of the library, say microcontrollers. Um, on the right-hand side, you see there are these green boxes with a number. That's the number of authorized distributors that sell those parts. And because Octopart, we have relationships with almost all electronic component distributors, we have a, a great view about what the availability is in the supply chain day to day. And we can use that information to curate the library around parts that are available in the supply chain. And since we launched it, um, in September of last year, we've iterated a couple times, maybe five or six times, where we've made some slight changes to ensure that, that there wouldn't be supply chain problems based on our supply chain data. The second important um, thing I want to point out is our partnership with Snap EDA, which has been working on building out the symbols and footprints for, uh, for the components. That's to help you get started de designing PCBs really quickly. Uh, this was another common theme that I hear when I talk to Octoparts users, is that coming up with the symbols and footprints for a variety of, of design software is a real pain. There's a lot of repeated effort. Um, and, and with Snap EDA, we've, we've been able to streamline that. And so if you use CPL parts, the process of getting symbols and footprints is gonna be, it's gonna be pretty easy, and those are licensed under uh, Creative Commons. Um, share alike license. So you can use them in commercial products, no problem. Um, so um, another key innovation, let's say, that we, we, we came up with is a concept of a CPL part number. Now, has anybody seen that XKCD comic where you show all these different standards and then you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this by coming up with uh, a new standard and really now you just have like another problem. Um, well, the, the, the comic says, I should have put the comic on here, um, but 
basically, we were very, uh, when, when we're thinking about coming up with a new set of part numbers, we did it in a very conservative way uh, because we don't want to just put out more part numbers. Really, the common part library part numbers are, are not part numbers. They're really identifiers that identify a group of parts that are either very close or are actually swap and replacements. Um, and that way, we can identify, you can refer to a one microfarad 0602 res, uh, capacitor uh, in, a, in, a, in a very easy way. And, and what we do is we identify a number of manufacturers that make the same part. This is important when you go to manufacturing because it might, it might be the case that one of the manufacturers, their, their, uh, their, their, their production lines are down and you need to go to a replacement. Um, so that's another key feature of the CPL is that wherever possible, we find uh, second and, and sometimes third and fourth sources for all of the components. Um, so uh, like I mentioned before, um, the, uh, the common parts library for production is great once you have a design that, wants to, that is ready for production. The feedback that we received from, from designers, from hardware startups, was that we need help in the prototyping phase. And this is before we're dealing with tiny surface mount components. This is when we're, we're playing around with breadboards and development kits. And that, that was the, the inspiration and the impetus for the common parts library for prototyping, which Sanke is gonna speak about. Thanks, Sam, for giving an introduction to CPL for prototyping. So over the last one year, uh, we visited many hackathons and talked with many makers. And what we found out was like a lot of people have this question that before we go to production and PCB design, they want to do a lot more breadboarding and figuring out like how to try out that idea on a breadboard first. And we heard questions like, what is a good through hole component? Or what is a good BLE module or Wi-Fi module to use in the project? And you know, a lot of these questions, you'll agree with me, are very open-ended. And there might not be a one simple answer to a lot of these questions. There might be many BLE boards out there which might meet your requirement, but it's just sometimes hard to figure out what one, which one is the best. So, but the good thing is there are a lot of great folks out there who have written amazing content around these parts and who also have great boards in their website. Sites such as Adafruit, SparkFun, I'm sure a lot of them, a lot of people use them here. Yes, almost everyone. So, yeah, so uh, Adafruit and SparkFun are doing a great job of making uh, great boards uh, which suit the maker's needs. So, but the thing is, a lot of the content is kind of all over the place, and we wanted to bring the entire wealth of information into one ecosystem. So let's say you want to, I'll, I'll show you more examples later, but let's say you were setting up an electronics lab in your school, and you're looking for a soldering station, you can come to this CPL for prototyping and find out what is what goes with soldering, what you might need, and so on and so forth. So we are really excited to present Common Parts Library for prototyping. It is basically, simply put, commonly used through-hole components for prototyping. So what Sam talked about was about the SMD components, the, all the symbols and footprints. This library is more for breadboarding and uh, using through-hole components. And this library has been expanded to include development boards, platforms, equipment, connectors, switches, anything that you might need to make a prototyping easier. So the goal of this CPL for prototyping is to make prototyping faster and cheaper. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how this might help you in your own project. The first example is for platforms. And I'm sure you'll also agree with me that you might have had a tough time figuring out what Arduino to get for your project, because there are just a lot of them out there. And, but the thing is, there are many people out there who have written good content on how to select an Arduino. So over here in this category, you would find links to Arduino, comparison charts, buying guides, and so on. And then you can buy your Arduino. Let's say you got an Arduino Uno for your project. Now you're figuring out, OK, it's cool to do a simple stuff like digital and analog signals, but you want to learn maybe more advanced stuff like I2C communication. So for that, we have some great tutorials here which you can go in the site and get to them. So the same thing goes with Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Beagle Bone Black, Texas Instruments Launchpad, and so on. So it's all collected in one place. So if you're looking for a platform for your project, you can come in and figure out what's the best. And you also have great project ideas from sites such as Hackster, Hackaday, Adafruit, Magazine, and so on. 
The next example is interface boards. And I'm sure this is something which has affected everyone. Whenever you're trying to make a connected product, you're always figuring out what's a good Wi-Fi module to use or what's a good BLE module to use. I'm sure I, I have struggled a lot with this myself. So in this category, we have collected some popular uh, Wi-Fi modules, such as uh, Particle, Electric M, and uh, ESP8266, which I'm sure a lot of people have played with. Uh, then you will also find uh, cellular, BLE, GPS, and so on. So it's all collected in one ecosystem. The next example, similar to the interface boards, is test equipment. And this is, again, something which is a big pain point for many people, is what's a good multimeter to get from a lab, or what's the power supply or the oscilloscope. So here, you will find like four multimeters. It was a very tough decision to choose one of them. But you will find four of them here, and they are for different budgets. So if you are free on budget, you could choose the one from Fluke. But if you were like low on budget, you can choose the one from Mastec. And same thing goes with power supply and oscilloscope. Then the last example that I want to use is of headers. And the thing is that it looks very simple, but it can be very complicated to choose a good jumper or a header for your breakout board. And here is a collection of some popular headers that you can use in your project. And this will really speed up your process. These are the kind of things that you should not spend time on. And uh, here, if you come in, you'll just get it. And you can spend time on more complicated and bigger problems that you're trying to solve. So this is Common Parts Library for prototyping. And uh, we are really excited to launch it. And uh, please give us your feedback. Uh, we just recently launched a Slack chat room. Uh, please get your invitation, and it's a live chat feature, so you can just come in and talk with us. Uh, there are going to be other makers as well there, and we can have a conversation about what should be in the CPL, what should not be there, and if there's any feedback, please give that to us. The most important slide, the link to the library, is octopart.com slash CPL. It's really easy to remember. Uh, do check it out and uh, see if you find it useful for your project, and do give us your feedback. Uh, you can reach out to us directly at these email addresses, and uh, we look forward to your feedback and uh, talk to you later. Thank you so much. My name is Andreas Olofsson, and uh, I want to talk to you today about open source chip design. Um, my background is as a chip designer for the last uh, almost 20 years, since 1996, uh, first in big companies, and since 2008 in my own company. So even in this room, there are probably a thousand different integrated circuits you know, in a community open source. Uh, I would bet big money that there's not a single one here that has an open source chip on their body. And the, am I going to lose that one? <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, and the question is why? Right? Why are there no open source chips? Um, and it's more of an economical question than a philosophical question. Uh, why haven't we made it happen? Uh, today we define open source hardware at the electronics portion as kind of the Gerbers and above, uh, you know, not the chip below. We've said that. Maybe that's too expensive. We'll leave that to the big companies. Um, it's OK to have a board with closed source chips, because there are no open source chips. Um, so the chip you see here is uh, something I designed in uh, 2011. It's a 64-core microprocessor as a very small company. It's not open source, but it's, it was done at about 1 hundredth of the cost of something like the big companies do. And the question is, can we make it free? And what does that mean? Um, but before I start talking about open source chip design, uh, I want to talk about a baby step we did in 2012, where we launched our first open source platform, uh, which was at the hardware level, completely open source, open docs, um, open Gerbers, open drivers, um, open software, everything, GPL license. And uh, um, what we found out was up until that point, uh, we'd worked very hard in designing chips. But uh, as Andy Grove of Intel would say, 
only the paranoid survive. So we only released our documents under NDA. Um, and uh, the company was dying. And by opening up, we actually saved the company. Um, and at the end, we raised almost a million dollars in Kickstarter. We had severe challenges. Um, like I think the, the speaker, uh, uh, Nancy, said in the, in the morning, uh, many of those similar problems. The company almost went out of business, but it didn't. Uh, we persisted and survived and certainly would, would have gone out of business if we wouldn't have done this project. So all in all, it was, it was all good. Um, and in terms of openness, so um, it was a huge success. Um, we, uh, we survived because of it and increased many things like sales, for example, by 40x before and after. Um, so now, why can't the same thing happen in chip design? So those of you who don't know chip design, uh, it's, not, it's very opaque. The chip industry is one of the most opaque industries around. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's, it's not that complicated. Students design chips all the time uh, at a smaller scale, PhD students at universities. Um, small companies tend to not design chips because of the cost. Uh, but basically, you start with an architecture uh, specification. Um, you'll take that architecture specification, and you'll create some design at the microarchitecture level. Uh, that could be done with a schematic. So you, you're putting down symbols. Uh, most of digital logic, at least, is done with Boolean algebra. So, you know, ands and or gates and things like that, um, storage. Um, and so you express this in some way. It used to be done with a schematic. Today it's done with uh, higher level languages, although quite arcane, things like Verilog, VHDL. Um, and that language you feed into a compiler, a silicon compiler, uh, which first translates that into um, to, um, some kind of um, netlist representation. And then you have a secondary translation step that translates that into actual polygons that get printed on the chip uh, at the factory. And of course, once you have the silicon, you have to package it up. And then once you have a packaged chip, you can put it down the board and voila, you have something you can use. And some of the numbers that you see there on the left are some of the ridiculous costs of designing chips. Um, I mean, could you imagine telling a software designer that uh, every bug you have costs you a year and a million dollars? There wouldn't be very many software companies out there. Uh, at least not very many profitable ones. And so um, hard, hardware design and chip design is very, very difficult. Um, and to give you some more ideas of the costs involved today um, and the hurdles for making it open source, engineering, things are complex. You need a lot of engineers. Engineers are expensive um, and take time. Again, a year-long process. Uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, that's where most of the money goes to. So if we can make it simpler, we can do it better. And by sharing more information, we can make those engineers much more efficient. Uh, IP licensing, today all the big companies, the reason they can actually produce chips at a reasonable cost is they license a lot of the IP that goes into it, which means that there are companies out there building proprietary IP, um, companies like Arm, who charges millions of dollars for licensing costs, and uh, which means also makes it out of scope for a lot of small companies uh, and, and projects. The tools, the silicon compilers they use are also costing millions of dollars. Um, the tape outs themselves, uh, when you actually ship the mask set, today is $5 million at 14 nanometer. Um, and you go down that, that line. So we're talking about anywhere from a million at the absolute minimum up to a billion dollars to develop a silicon platform. Um, and that's why we consider, we draw the line at the, at the chip because clearly for the most people, the idea of having an open source computer uh, that includes the chip is just a philosophical question. It's not economically not practical. But what if we could make chip design free? And free as in freedom, and maybe free as in beer. Um, and what would that mean? So what's happened uh, in the kind of Moore's Law death march over the last 50 years where all the companies are driving towards zero, right? Um, the per cost, uh, per transistor cost every year got cheaper. It's driven a lot of companies out of business. Um, there are a few very, very big ones left. And uh, I mean, to be honest with you, the commercial companies, they only care about money. And because they're five to $50 billion companies, they only care about very big money. Which means that if you come in with uh, maybe a very important project for whatever reason, whether it's medical or social or something, um, you will not get the attention. So the only way you can design that project is by utilizing a commercial product that's gone into high volume opportunity like a smartphone, um, and using that. And of course, unfortunately, a lot of those smartphone chips are, are also opaque. They don't even have data sheets. Um, but 
the, the key area here is what do you do between the one and 100,000 unit interesting idea or system that maybe you could build with a, with a chip. You could use a chip there. And it, does, it doesn't really help you to put together weird parts that maybe have all kinds of junks that you don't need uh, where you could just design one chip that could, you know, I mean, again, uh, sky's the limit in terms of imagination here. Um, but the, the areas are really not the consumer electronics, but the really interesting stuff, the health, the robotics, science, um, that, do, that really can't spin their own chips. Um, and, and this is, I mean, talk about the, the kind of the grand challenge of open source design. Um, you're going to displace $100 billion worth of industry to make this happen. Um, the IP industry is a $5 billion industry. There is some open source code, but mostly goes into devices called FPGAs. Very few people, if any, use open source design to put into real chips. Um, the EDA industry, the ones that make the silicon compiler. The sad part is in the 1980s, uh, mostly in Silicon Valley, when they started working on logic synthesis and place and route, those universities actually had open source tools. And then they handed over the open source tools to the contractors, right, the EDA companies and startups that spun out of those universities. And it all went proprietary, and it's very much proprietary today. And those companies spent billions of dollars to make incredible tools that work amazingly. I use those tools every day. Uh, but uh, a seat of those, uh, of those tools can cost you a million dollars, so certainly not free. Um, and um, similar issues are in the packaging and the manufacturing. So um, this is not something that you know, one or two people can solve. Um, but it's solved a problem. It's been solved in industry. It's been solved in silos. Um, so um, I do believe it's a, it's a solvable problem. Um, so in conclusion, as a, as a chip guy, I'm very proud of our industry. Uh, we make a lot of things happen, especially with Moore's Law. Uh, the exponential growth in semiconductor uh, over 50 years is unprecedented in history. Maybe we'll never see it again, although I doubt that because I'm an optimist. But it is incredible. So I think we have a responsibility to extend Moore's Law for another 50 years. And the way it is today, it's going to end by 2020. And so what do we do to extend Moore's Law by another 50 years? I believe that open source is a big part of that um, to make it happen. Thank you. Hello. I think it's funny that my talk is in the middle of a, a session called From Chips to Product. To borrow a, a, I guess, a rock pun from the first presentation, sometimes between chips and product, IP will tear us apart. Of course, uh, licenses are a tool that we use to try to stop IP from tearing us apart in that process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some recent developments in Creative Commons licenses that are pertinent to open hardware. But the underlying theme I want to get at is really moving the community's focus from thinking about policy in terms of individual and project license choice to public policy. And I, I really think that uh, Joshua Pierce's presentation was an, was an awesome example of that earlier. I believe he mentioned using an open viral license once, but at the close of his presentation, he had several slides on the public policy changes needed to make uh, open hardware and open science to default. Uh, I, production note, I noticed uh, looking for imagery for this presentation that the flag of Philadelphia could be interpreted as a flag for open hardware. I decided to improve that a little bit. I put a uh, blue LED on the shield. Uh, and so that's your remix slide for a Creative Commons talk. I'm sure that many of you can do better. I also said that I would dedicate this talk to uh, colleague Basil Cartabil, who's a Syrian political prisoner uh, since 2012. He's a founder of Creative Commons Syria. This is a uh, uh, scene from Creative Commons Global Summit in 2013 calling for his release. He's really at risk. His prison is actually on the front lines being contested by the Syrian army and uh, the army of Islam right now. All we can really do is raise visibility, so I encourage you to look up Free Basil. Um, I'm also going to use Basil as a prop here. Basil uh, kind of came, uh, got involved in open stuff at a time in his, of, of our ten temperament that he sees value in openness across all a bunch of different fields. And I really think that open hardware is the uh, kind of meta movement 
where all of the different opens are coming together. It's really the most eclectic. And you can see that in much of presentations earlier today about education and science. Um, and one of the ways that, uh, that eclecticism uh, plays out is that open hardware uses licenses associated with a bunch of other fields. This is a survey from 2013, but from my experience, license change happens very slowly as projects start and die. So it's probably still fairly accurate. But the thing to, thing to uh, note here is that there are licenses that are more typically associated with content or software, and there's one, uh, one specifically open hardware license here. So I want to talk about my, the way that I frame licenses. One, you can think of them as, as offering permissions that they're deregulatory, if you want to think about it and uh, kind of extrapolate to public policy terms. And they also have conditions, which you can think of as being regulatory in public policy terms. Now, the, the permissions are actually really necessary to create a low-risk environment for open, for open collaboration, and they're relatively straightforward. Conditions are what basically everybody likes to argue about, and they're not very straightforward and are the cause of most of uh, the problems with incompatibility. And one kind of ironic incompatibility problem is uh, multiple copyleft licenses that are not compatible with each other. In other words, you have two works, one under a CC by SA, for example, another, another under the GPL or the CERN OHL. You can't combine them uh, because of this incompatibility. But uh, th so that's a, pro that's a major problem with licenses, but the, a much bigger problem is actually people who don't use licenses at all. You can see the most frequent response to this survey was I've released files without an explicit license, which means there's no permission, there's no um, attempt to create a risk-free environment for open collaboration. However, there's a much, much bigger problem, and that is that most hardware designs and designers don't see themselves as being part of the open hardware movement, maybe don't even have any conception of it. So I'd like to keep that last problem in mind if you're tempted to debate uh, put licenses against each other. Really, the, the problem is that uh, the open hardware movement needs to get much, much bigger. It's still worth uh, thinking about how to make licenses work better, and I'll talk a bit about that, but, but I also, it's really necessary, coming back to that theme I mentioned at the beginning, to look beyond private application of, of licenses to public policy. Um, so there are se uh, several things that I think uh, somebody developing a new license version or a new license ought to consider if the goal is to, in general, improve the commons. And I won't go into details on these for time's sake, but I encourage you to look at my slides. One is differentiation, so basically add something new to the ecosystem. Uh, do you grant necessary permissions? I think this has been inadequately looked at for, for open hardware because people are really excited about enforceability, which is the condition side of it. But in order to create a low-risk environment for, uh, for collaboration, getting all of the permissions solid is, is the most important thing. And then there's the conditions or regulation side of it. And I, I really want people to think about how, how the licenses, which are private instruments, how they prototype public policy. Um, then a new license or new license version should uh, at worse not decrease uh, compatible, should not introduce new compatibility problems and preferably should increase interoper interoperability. Um, and I, I'd like to see more cross-domain thinking in licenses as opposed to licenses developed in the silo of, of open data or, or open source software or even, or even open source hardware. I think one of the big problems is there's not a lot of sharing of knowledge because there aren't enough people like Basil who are really involved in, in everything. And uh, basically reinventing tools and practices that have already been trialed out, especially in software. So one example of a new license version is uh, Creative Commons version 4.0. Uh, this is a visual representation or actually a screen capture uh, comparing uh, ver version 3.0 Creative Commons attribution share alike and uh, version 4.0. Uh, it, there are a bunch of improvements in 4.0. Overall, it's easier to understand, easier to comply with, more global. I think you can kind of see that easier to understand on the previous slide. You can see there's a lot more obvious structure in the 4.0, a lot less big blobs of paragraphs of, of legal text. Um, I want to talk about two particular changes of interest to open source hardware. One is the uh, compatibility mechanism, which 
it reduces that incompatibility problem that I highlight, highlighted before. Um, and this uh, is the uh, quote from the license that shows the actual legal text that accomplishes that. And we have a, a Creative Commons has a process by which it can uh, declare other licenses either one way or two way compatible with uh, CC by SA. Um, and that process existed before, but it was never, uh, never actually used because it was much, it was too narrow. And so we actually have declared uh, compatibility with one, with one other copyleft license so far, the free art license. It's probably not particularly interesting to the open hardware community, but it's kind of proof that this mechanism really does work. We're, I think, very close to uh, this becoming reality that CC by SA will be un unilaterally or donor compatible with GPLv3. That means that you'll be able to take a CC by SA project, uh, adapt it or combine it with a uh, project under the GPL, and release the derivative work, so the derivative de design, for example, under the GPL. That really mitigates one of the big incompatibility problems. So you see the, uh, the I'm reproducing that survey results with the incompatibility between uh, GPL and CC by SA greatly lightened. There's another uh, development in CC version 4.0, both CC by and by SA, which are both some, sometimes used for open hardware. And that is that patent, uh, patent grant is, ex is explicitly excluded. One was never actually explicitly included, but um, explicit exclusion makes the, it clarifies things, but it also really highlights that open hardware projects that have any concern about patents and wanna make sure that collaborators aren't um, collaborating in bad spirit because they hold patents that could, they could use to tax everybody later on means that you need to think about other approaches. One, of course, is moving to a license that uh, has a that has a uh, patent grant in it. GPLv3 is one, and uh, if we get compatibility, that will help there. If you're more into permissive licenses, then a, Apache is one of those. Uh, there, there are also other sort of external to the license mechanisms you can use that. Imitate what, happened, imitate what happens in standards bodies. There are also uh, patent focused tools that, I, that are complementary uh, to open licenses. Defensive patent license is one. It's really a patent club. Because of the way it's structured, it's complementary, not a replacement. You can read my analysis of it if you're interested in the details. So I want to get to the public policy side of this. These are these are all uh, these these images are all things that are highly regulated of great public interest, vulnerable uh, to both criminals and states and vendor lock-in, and their hardware designs matter as well as their uh, software as well as the openness of their software and data. Now I want to suggest that that open source hardware might offer a lightweight regulatory framework that encourages innovation and discourages both regulatory capture and capture by proprietary interests. And that's the direction, that's a very important direction that the open hardware move, movement ought to be focusing its, uh, its kind of political and policy efforts. So there are several paths that you can take from licenses to public policy. Uh, at, you can think of as licenses being a way to do that at the individual level. You're setting your individual IP policy, but it can be done at an organizational or a, or a field uh, that you know, has a dominant funder to uh, actually changing the law at the government levels. Um, I put, those, put these into a few different categories. One is uh, that the entity actually creating the works stipulates uh, an open IP policy. Another one is that the funder stipulates it. Another is basically a demand side thing that the, the entity uh, using or procuring the wh whatever the thing is it mandates that it's open. And then there's actually changing the law either by liberalizing uh, the law or changing regulations. And I, I wanna encourage people interested in pursuing openness as a policy matter to think about how public policy can specifically benefit the open hardware ecosystem, not just generic patent or copyright reform, which there's a huge hurdle for and, and is, you know, always ends up in the, in the favor of, of huge industries. So I just wanna highlight a couple of things that Creative Commons has done that are in the vein of moving from licenses to public policy. Uh, this is for educational materials and a scientific publication. Basically, they, they 
primarily fall into the into the funder side of this mandates that stuff that's publicly funded be published under public license so that everybody can have have use for it which also has important distributional um, effects so the the thing I want to uh, leave you with is that open licenses public prototype open public policy and think about what this means and how to implement that in the context of open source hardware. Oh, and also uh, Creative Commons is having another global summit um, and there will, I'm sure there will be another scene urging the release of, of Basel, um, but it's in Seoul uh, next month and there will be a couple of sessions on open hardware, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and here are some links. Thank you very much. All right, I've been instructed to use the mic. At Mach 30, we believe that the key to open source hardware for everyone is high quality open source engineering tools. Without tools like this, Participating in advanced open source hardware projects could cost participants tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, or if you want to do chip design, apparently millions. And while there is certainly a growing body of open source electrical engineering tools, things like KiCad and the like, fields including CAD, computer aided drafting and design, and engineering documentation lack sufficient open source tools. At Mach 30, we live by this belief that using all open source engineering tools for our open source hardware projects is essential. And we do this on all of our projects, even when those tools don't yet exist. Did I not advance the slide correctly? No, I'm, no, I would, that, that was slide was supposed to be blank, honest. There's a method to the madness. <laughs> it's okay, it's all good. Looking out for me. All right, for those of you that don't know who Mach 30 is, we are a US-based nonprofit dedicated to hastening the advancement of, open, of uh, humanity into a spacefaring civilization, primarily by developing open source hardware for spaceflight. Yeah, open source rockets. And I am Jay Simmons. I'm the founder and president of Mach 30. I hold a PhD in space systems engineering, AKA rocket science. And one of my roles at Mach 30 is to run our open source initiatives currently. So how exactly do we manage to live by that creed that I opened the presentation with when we find that we don't have the open source engineering tools that we need? Well, whenever possible, we find promising projects to contribute our time to, to improve them, to bring them up to the level we need. Failing that, we will break down and develop our own tools, open source, of course. Whenever we contribute to or develop new tools, that work is tied to specific open source hardware projects to ensure that the engineering tools have well understood and need driven requirements. We don't want to just go off wandering, doing things off uh, project scope just because it might be cool later. So we want to focus on what we need today. And then finally, we make sure that we apply these in development open source software tools to those projects that drove the needs so that we can verify that we are actually developing the tools that are needed. All right, Rocket Science 101 in like two seconds. This is the architecture diagram, for, it's a block diagram for the simplest kind of rocket engine you can build. It's called a cold gas thruster. Cold gas thrusters yield their propulsive thrust simply by the energy stored in a compressed gas. There's no combustion, none of that. It's just put high pressure gas in a, in a propellant tank and bleed it off. And that energy gives us thrust. Not a lot, but enough for some purposes. Mach 30 is currently designing its own uh, cold gas thruster called the Yavin thruster. And Yavin is actually ideally suited to driving the development of engineering tools. 
because one, it relies on engineering analysis across multiple disciplines, rocket propulsion, structural analysis, things like that. And these engineering analyses need to drive parametric CAD models. And of course, those parametric CAD models then need to be actually manufactured in the real world to create the thruster. So let me get into each of those steps in a little more detail and tools that we are specifically developing to support Yavin. The first one I want to talk about is our mathematics toolkit. Advanced projects like Yavin require a great deal of upfront mathematical analysis in order to design, size, and predict the performance of the project. Um, as open source hardware developers, it's essential that we document those analyses that we're doing up front. Uh, to show the fundamental principles, the implementation, and the results for peer review, and to thoroughly document our projects. Mach 30's MTK, the Mathematics Toolkit, allows developers to create this documentation at the same time and more critically in the same environment as they are creating those analyses. We're implementing this in Python as its analysis language with the goal of creating this single versatile tool to support doing your analysis, we're doing that by building in key libraries that engineers need, like things for support for units. No more what units was that. Your math has first class units in every operation. And support for documentation by integrating Jupyter notebooks from the IPython world with, the, with a Python IDE. Probably right now we're looking at Spider. So put that all married together and get a single environment for documentation and math analysis. That second step was parametric CAD. Who's uh, done, who's used open source CAD tools? Okay, when I say CAD tools, I mean things I can get engineering drawings out of. So who's done CAD tools that aren't, that go all the way to engineering drawings? And it's a little, little smaller crowd, right? <clears throat> when we went looking for open source CAD tools, we, did, we actually looked at both open source and proprietary just to understand the full market. When we went looking, we, we came up with this chart and saw that it's actually very hard to find something that'll do all the things you need. Um, but we actually wound up finding one that was close, and so we contributed to it actively, and this is called CAD Query. It's a Python-based parametric CAD language uh, that is actually inspired by the way jQuery accesses the document object model in browsers. Key factors that favored selecting CAD Query were its ease of use, powerful API, and active development community. Python, because it uses Python, it has another big benefit. It's compatible with our MTK work, which means analyses done in MTK can come right into our CAD models and directly drive parameters for sizing. And finally, we're uh, actively uh, developing Yavin to be 3D printable on home 3D printers so that uh, schools and, uh, and people at home can actually do their own uh, rocket experiments to understand rocket propulsion better. Here's an example of said part. <clears throat> and we get that geometry right out of CAD query and then uh, as an STL and take it to our printer and go. The really interesting thing to me here is that beyond just getting the parts out, focusing on manufacturing also as a key part of our processes is giving the Avon team the opportunity to research, test, and document. There's that big word again the performance of 3D printed materials, calibration techniques for 3D printers, and finishing steps for 3D printed parts. And of course, all of this material is going onto the Yavin project page. So, in summary, I showed you the cold gas thruster block diagram and told you how Mach 30 is using Yavin to uh, guide the development of CAD query and MTK and our manufacturing experience. And I open by sharing uh, one of our guiding principles at Mach 30 for open source hardware development and discussed how we apply that principle to our open source hardware projects even when sufficient tools don't already exist. So, what do you think? You can check out MTK, CAD Query, and the Avon Thruster at the links you see there.
use the mic. Hello, Open Hardware Summit. I am so excited to be here. This is my favorite day of the year. I love coming to the Open Hardware Summit. I'm so excited that it is back in the United States where I can access it easily and affordably. And thank you all for coming. I'm Michael Weinberg. I'm the, the president of the board of the Open Source Hardware Association, Oshawa. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about what Oshawa has been up to, what Oshawa will be doing in the future, how you, yes, you, can get involved in Oshawa in a number of different and exciting ways. So this is the update of what's going on in the world of open source hardware as seen through Oshawa. So first and foremost, there are so many people that would be it would be totally appropriate to thank right now because we don't have time to do that. There are a couple of people that I really need to take a second to thank. Uh, the first people are the summit chairs, Dustin and Addy. They have done an amazing job. If you see them today, say they're busy, so say thank you. If you see them tonight or even you know any time in the next six months, buy them a drink and say thank you so much. They really they are like they are the flux capacitors of the open hardware summit. They are they're what make the summit possible. I also want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, they came in, they help us, they help us be able to secure this beautiful building um, that we have here. They help us uh, with the amazing goodie bags that you got. Uh, there's still stuff out on the table if you want. So a huge thank you to them. They, I guess, we're, if we're going to continue the analogy, they are the, the Mr. Fusion of the Open Hardware Summit. They, they power us in a lot of ways. And then I also wanted to say a special thank you to those sponsors who are Oshawa corporate members because in addition to sponsoring the summit, so many of them, they sponsor Oshawa itself, and it really makes possible what Oshawa is doing. And I keep saying, Oshawa, 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 like you, of course, all know what that is, which of course you do, but just in case there are some of you that don't, I'm gonna tell you. So Oshawa is the Open Source Hardware Association. We are a member-driven, all-volunteer organization that is really set up to be a place to, to help drive and bring together the open source hardware community. And what we're really about it is creating this space. We're all, we're all together in this sort of mind space of open source hardware, but to be a kind of common point for all of us to come together and, and think about open source hardware and discuss open source hardware and talk about how to, to bring other people into the world of open source hardware. And you heard me right, it's a member-driven organization. And so today you have a great opportunity. Actually, every day you have a great opportunity. But today you're sitting in this room and you might say to yourself, could I become a member of the Open Source Hardware Association? And the answer is, Yes, yes you can. Uh, and the way that you do it is you go to oshawa.org. Oshawa.org, it can be a hard URL to remember. It's like oshawa.org. Oshawa is the Open Source Hardware Association. And so when you put those letters together, that's oshawa and then .org, because it's a nonprofit. So you can find it, you can go there, you can, you can think about being a member, which would be amazing. And then if you really want to get super involved in Oshawa, right now, uh, as you sit there, as you fan yourself, we have uh, board positions that are open. So if you want to help guide the future of Oshawa, if you have strong opinions about what Oshawa is doing, if, you, if there's a project that you think Oshawa should be really engaged with, a really fantastic way to help drive that is to become a board member of Oshawa. So you can nominate yourself Voting is at the end of the month. I really recommend it. There are a number of board members here today. If you have questions about you know, what it's like, how is it, a, is it a super fantastic experience or is it an amazingly fantastic experience, they can talk to you about it. They'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, the, the voting is at the end of this month. And so if you are a member, and you know, if you're just passionate but you don't have time to become a board member, if you become a member of Osh where you can help vote on those candidates, they all fill out a questionnaire and help guide the future. So what is Oshawa doing? 
First and foremost, every year we put on the Open Hardware Summit, and this is really the space to bring everyone together in person, see these amazing presentations, and really talk to each other in person, one-on-one, -on -one, to think about what's happening in the world of open source hardware. This is the most important thing that we do every year. And it, it takes an incredible amount of work, and we're so glad that it's, it's happening, that you're all here. But we also do some other things. Um, recently, we've been opening international chapters because open source hardware is not just a thing that's happening in the United States. It's not just a thing that's happening in English. And so local chapters, international chapters of Oshawa, really help to build a bridge between this international open source hardware community and the local community. They can translate it in, in terms of local languages, they can translate it in terms of local culture, and then also bring what's happening at those local levels back to the community at large. So we have some chapters that are opening, we have some more in the pipeline, we're really excited about it. I think it's a great thing for the future of open source hardware. Now sometimes, uh, and this happens to me as a board member, I know it happens to Alicia all the time, people come up and they say, you know, I love the idea of open source hardware. I wish there was like a concrete definition of open source hardware. And I wish there was, if there was like a comprehensive best practices on how to do open source hardware, it would be really great. And it would be really great. It's so great that on the website, oshawa.org, we have those things. And they are, they are great resources for people who are beginning to do open source hardware and want to make sure that they really, they're doing it right. They understand. They want a kind of assistance on what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, some of the common uh, challenges that are going on. So I really urge you to check out the, the website for some really great in-depth information about how to handle that. And if you get through all that information and you have more questions, this is a super exciting thing that happened after the last summit, um, so we get to talk about it now, is there is now a book, Building Open Source Hardware. Alicia has done an amazing job of pulling together this incredible resource. Yeah, you can clap for that. Proceed, there, there are some for sale in the back. Uh, proceeds come help benefit Oshawa, do what Oshawa does. And it really is, I mean, it is, it is, it's the book of building open source hardware. And so it's a great resource, especially in conjunction with the website, if you're looking to do open source hardware and looking to do open source hardware right. Uh, the last thing quickly that we've been doing is, uh, and this is actually a great segue from the earlier talk, we've been working to raise the profile of open source hardware among policymakers in other communities. And so just an example of that, uh, we signed on to a brief at the, at, at the federal appeals court. This is the court that deals with patent issues. Often they deal with it very poorly. Uh, but we weighed in and represented Oshawa and Oshawa members to, in a case that was talking about, it was talking about printer cartridges actually, but really talking about the importance of when you buy something, that means that you get to use it, you get to change it, you get to modify it, you get to resell it, even if it's patented. That doesn't mean that that patent holder forever gets to say no. And this is critical for building open source hardware and for integrating components into open source hardware. So those are all the things that we've been doing. We're really excited about it. Uh, we hope you are too. There is one other thing that I want to talk about. And like I said, you know, we get a lot of questions at, at Oshawa about how to do open source hardware and the best way to go forward. But we also get questions from people who say, you know, I, I go online, I see a project, I see some hardware, and it says that it's open source hardware. But I'm not totally sure if their version of open source hardware is my version of open source hardware. You know, could there be some sort of certification for open source hardware? And so a couple of months ago, we as the board started really, at an organization, really started to look seriously at this question. And we sent out a list of questions. You can see them on the website. It was 10 super in-depth questions. And we asked the community, we asked you, tell us what you think about this. And in the forums, we had amazing discussions about all of those questions, about all these different aspects of how you could do this certification. Uh, what would you want? What wouldn't you want? How should we think about it? And so today, I'm super excited to be able to say that we're rolling out the first version of the open source hardware certification. 
And this is going to be something that's a real, hopefully, a resource to the community and for people outside the community who want to get more involved and, and certify their thing as open source hardware and also who want to know that things they see advertised as open source hardware maybe really are open source hardware. So the, the entire specification is up on the site. It'll be up at the end of this talk. And I say entire specification. It's three and a half pages long. Don't worry. It's not, it's not too scary. Um, but I want to go over the, the highlights right now just to give you a sense of, of where we landed. So with the certification, the first issue, and this is a huge issue, was should we have a bunch of different levels for certification? Should we have like, you know, open bronze, open silver, open gold? And there's a lot of back and forth, and there are a lot of strong opinions about it, but ultimately what we decided is there's one level of certification. You're open source hardware certified or you're not. And that's how it's going to work. However, we recognize that when you're building open source hardware, a lot of the time you're using components that are outside of your control. And some of them aren't open. And so we shouldn't punish people who are building open source hardware just because they don't have the ability to control every component that's going into the project. And so another part of this, and this came directly out of feedback that we got on, on the website, is the certification is tied to your contribution to the project. You or your group or your company. The things that are in your control that you are contributing, those need to comply with the definition. Those need to comply with best practices. If you do that, you can become certified even if you're using third-party closed hardware. And that's because while we love to work towards a world where you can build a fully integrated piece of hardware and everything along the line is open, we recognize pragmatically we're not there yet, and so we really want to focus on the things that are in your control. The other things are, there was some discussion about fees to register, to use the registration. Uh, it's free. Anyone can use it. There's no fee associated with it. You do, however, have to register. This is going to be a very lightweight registration process. It's basically going to be sending an email with some information. The reason for this mostly was we wanted to build a kind of comprehensive list in a single place where you could go and find out everything that's certified. And this is not going to be, this is not intended to replace uh, websites that have sort of full sets of tools for engineering, for open source hardware. It's just going to be kind of a central place you can go and look up and say, is this, you know, wh where are all the projects that are being officially licensed as open source hardware? And you can find it all in one place. And then finally, the certification wouldn't be worth a whole lot if bad actors could use it and not be punished. And so as Oshawa, we are committing to enforcing the rules of the certification. Now we recognize that, you know, we have to balance two things when you think about enforcement. Uh, one is there are, there are bad actors out there who are going to abuse the system, and we need to make sure that we can, we can challenge them and, and punish them if necessary. On the other hand, there are a number of people who are making good faith attempts to comply with certification, but you know, for totally innocent reasons, don't comply. And so for that reason, the enforcement process is, is staggered and tiered in a way where if you are using the certification and you are not compliant, you will get many opportunities to come into compliance before any real penalties are imposed. However, those real penalties do exist, and we maintain the option to do it to maintain the integrity of the certification. So that's what we have uh, going on in terms of what's next with, with the certification and with Oshawa. In the next couple of months, we're going to be working with some partners to turn the certification into a specific legal license and that language. So we'll be putting that together in the next couple of months. We also need to figure out what the certification logo actually looks like. So uh, pay attention to those things. For members, we're going to be having a, uh, a hangout, a meeting in the next couple of months. So one more time, if you, if you think you might want to be a member, that would be a great, a great reason to do that. And then also just generally, we rec really urge you again to check out the website. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, and connect with us because we're really trying to build this community in a useful way and tell us what works. Tell us what doesn't work. Uh, tell us what's helpful. And, and keep coming back to the summit because the thing that makes the summit, you know, uh, <laughs> Dustin and Addy are amazing and our sponsors are fantastic, but the, the summit exists because you find it worthwhile, because you're passionate about this 
because you're willing to make the trip. And so if you don't tell us what you like and what you don't like, we can't make that summit, uh, the next year summit, as best as possible. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you very much for being so involved and passionate about open source hardware. Check out the certification and let us know what you think. And uh, thank you so much. Just a couple quick announcements before we let you guys go out to lunch. Um, please visit the photo booth. Chris makes people look good. That's what I was supposed to say. Um, and the speakers for the next block, please come see Zach and Max before you go out to lunch. That's Kip Bradford, Joshua Lifton, Jet, Grace Ahn, Elizabeth Doyle, Bevan Weissman, Dan Beyer, and New American Public Art. And now that I announced the speakers for the next block, let's thank all of our speakers for this block. Good people. And okay, lunch now, and back in about an hour and a half, we're gonna start up again at 2.45. Oh no, the lunch. Yeah, you wanna say that? Um, for general attendees, there is food south, east, and north up here, pretty much. If you walk in any direction, you will find food. Best, Google is your best friend. Um, there's also pharmacies if you need deodorant. I know it's a little bit warm in here. <laughs> But we hope you agree that it's better than a sterile conference um, convention hall type of thing. So, There's also a Trader Joe's, like a block that way, as well as a 7-Eleven if you're just wanting some snacks, ice cream, whatever. Um, if anyone is um, a lady of open hardware, we're working a lot and we're very committed, obviously, as women of the open hardware community to keep a community of us together. So there are going to be some of us meeting for lunch if any of you are interested. Um, and you want to come to lunch with us, you're more than welcome. Uh, we'll just kind of be congregating up here and then going out. Once again, uh, just come back around 2.30 and we'll start again. Thanks.